Blog Talk Radio. Episode 160 of Songs of Salah here on 17 Numa Radio. Thank you for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Scott Thomas Outler, and it is Monday, September the 27th, 2021. I hope everyone has been inspired by the nostalgic spell cast by the shifting autumn season so far. It's certainly a magical time of year. Coming up in the next segment, I'll be joined by tonight's guest, Kristen Garth. Kristen was on the show recently as one of the authors during the Alien Buddha Press special last month when she read poems from her book, The Death of Alice in Wonderland. So I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to speak with her more in depth tonight for a full interview about her work. One of the topics we'll be covering is her forthcoming hybrid book, Crow Carriage, which is set to be released in October. Kristen is the author of over 20 books, so she always has new projects churning in her mind and it'll be exciting to find out what some of the current ideas she'll be working on through the final few months of 2021 are. So stay tuned for a conversation with and poems from Kristen Garth coming up in just a bit. And in the meantime, please be sure to subscribe to the channel while you're listening to the show. And if you're interested in checking out past episodes of Songs of Salah, they can all be found in the archive at 17numa.com. But they will cower from that which offers freedom and cling instead to a consciousness persuaded by fear. And woe be should that poison settle in your stomach gradually over time. Better you should spit it out and shun that which works through cancerous transgressions. Yet some would hate the truth with all their hearts, and they would spend their days staring through the distorted lens of inversion, and they would bathe in the filth of their own ignorance with mud caked thick in their eyes. And they would revel all the while in their folly and cast dispersions at those who sought to help them come clean. But what matter if they cast their lots with the thieves or turn their minds over to deception? For yours is a narrower path to travel. What do you want, a cookie? And all your good deeds and stains of sin will be piled on the same scale in the end, so bend your actions toward that which is righteous, and leave the consideration of such measures to higher forces. Well, this is the first episode of Songs of Salah that has aired in the past two weeks, so it's nice to be jumping back into the fray. I took a bit of a break from the show recently, and I suppose in the meantime I transitioned back into a sermon sort of mood and mode, It's important to keep the creative juices flowing at all times, so whichever direction the words happen to arrive from during any given phase, I do my best to just roll along with the energy, especially when it's of a spiritual and apocalyptic variety. We have to get our kicks where we can find them, right? Of course, there is no end to the distorted nature of events playing out across the world at the moment, more than enough to get whipped up into a frenzy of righteous indignation over. And on that note, this is another of my recent musings, a piece called Lizard Crown. Are you, in fact, aliens hatched from a decadent star system where the adaptation of parasitic qualities led you to evolve in a heinously warped fashion before setting forth across the galactic divide to hunt down another species that could be placed under your bloodthirsty spell? Are you demon swine spawned in the pits of hell, reared by the ghost of Joseph Mengele and Adolf Hitler, 
and then let loose as zombie avatars to continue carrying out their eugenics plan while plaguing us here on Earth? Are you the reincarnated spirits of Aztec priests returning to sacrifice more children during another round of carnage like you did atop the pyramids in ages past? Or are you just a gaggle of completely psychopathic lunatics dead set on projecting the unresolved inner trauma you suffer from within as a poisonous outward assault against anyone you can manage to lord over with your petty authoritarian edicts? Are you perverts? Are you sadists? Are you card-carrying members of a nihilistic death cult? Are you itching for a fight? Are you jaded criminals who actually want nothing more than to be stopped and brought to justice and so are acting out like spoiled brats in an unhinged manner while desperately longing to receive punishment? Are you truly prepared for the rubber band effect coming your way? Are you ready for reciprocation once karma is unleashed? Are you familiar with the sensation of how a rope feels pressed snugly against your neck? Ah, just a few thoughts about the technocratic so-called elite who have seized control at the helm and seem to have thrown all their cards on the table while making their final push toward complete world domination, along with some giddy anticipation of what the bite back is going to look like once they're judged at the coming Nuremberg-style trials. Oh, how I am anxiously looking forward to such a day. Hallelujah. Of course the beast system is to be resisted and opposed at all costs. That's perfectly obvious. It's the entire reason for being alive at this particular point in time. A test of spiritual discernment. A great blessing and responsibility, really. An opportunity to be thankful for. The system has already begun the process of cannibalizing itself. Thus, the thrashing and wailing of its death throes are being experienced. The outburst causes an awful lot of commotion, but signifies not but weakness and the eventual failure and fall of a pathological agenda. That which is evil carries within itself the seed of its own destruction. It is for us to simply step out of the way and let the chaos they have wrought lead not to the foe's sense of order they seek to impose, but rather to that which naturally arises for us as a new paradigm emerges. In the aftermath, dancing upon ashes. On a lighter and slightly more upbeat note, I'd be remiss not to mention that my new collaborative book written with Mihaila Melnik was released earlier this month and is now available through 17 Numa Press. I've spoken about Evermore quite a bit on previous episodes of the show throughout this year as the process of bringing the book to fruition was underway, so I won't repeat myself too much here tonight, but suffice it to say I'm thrilled with how the book turned out. If you enjoy my work, then I think you'll really dig Evermore. So please do swing by Amazon and snag a copy when you have a chance. Your support is greatly appreciated, for sure. This episode will be the last one to air before September draws to a close, and this month represents the three-year anniversary of when Songs of Salah initially launched back in 2018. It's been a hell of a ride, and I want to send out a huge thank you to all the talented and inspiring guests who have been a part of the journey so far. It's been a pleasure speaking with everyone who has appeared on the show, and here's looking forward to what the next three years have in store. It's going to be a blast. All right, I guess that'll wrap things up here at the top of the show. Let's head into a music break now and then return on the other side with tonight's guest, Kristen Garth. Stay tuned. Must be the season of the witch. Must 
the songs of Salah. If there's anyone interested in appearing as a guest on a future episode of the show, please feel free to get in contact with me via email at 17numa at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to get you set up for an episode coming up in these final months of 2021. Tonight's guest, Kristen Garth, is a Pushcart Risley nominated sonneteer and a Best of the Net 2020 finalist. Her sonnets have stalked journals like Glass, Yes, Five to One, Luna Luna, and more. She is the author of over 20 books of poetry, including Crow Carriage and The Stakes, and is the editor of seven anthologies. She is the founder of Pink Plastic House, a tiny journal, and co-founder of Performance Anxiety, an online poetry reading series. You can follow her on Twitter at Lola and Jolie and her website, KristenGarth.com. Kristen, thanks so much for joining the show tonight. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? <laughs> uh, things are going well here. Uh, how's your autumn starting off there in Florida? Oh, it's awesome. I, that's It's my favorite season. And um, I've been doing a poetry countdown for my poetry journal where so for the last, this tells you how much it's my favorite season, that for 91 days before Halloween, we've been counting down with a poem, a new original poem being published by somebody every day that's Halloween related or scary or strange or, you know, something like that. And, um, and you know, so now we're down to, you know, tonight I've got to do 34, 34 I think it's 34 days, um, so it's been a busy time. Right on, 91 days, that's getting an early jump on things, getting the <laughs> yeah. holiday forever going early. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is such an awesome time of year as the chill comes into the air. and uh, Yes, magical especially season. living in Florida. Because <laughs> it's very hot here, so in the summer, and so it is totally magical when that when that brutality ends. <laughs> yeah, absolutely hot and humid. So nice to get that yes. refreshing feeling going on. Yes. Well, happy to have you here on the show tonight, and got a lot to talk about. Got a lot of questions for you, but I guess a good place to start off maybe is with the new book that's set to be released next month. You want to talk a little uh-huh. bit about? Pro- Oh, yes, I would love to. Um, so <laughs> it has a kind of a um, – I a lot of my um, uh, origins of how my stories come to be are, uh, especially when they're like something said in the past, Crow Carriage is, you know, 1800s, but it's um, – it's in in England, but it was actually the very gem of it was inspired by me. I read a lot of true crime, and I was reading all these things about the Epstein and um, case and Ghislaine Maxwell. I'm not butcher her name, but um, the and that whole idea of like a female being um, complicit and something like that. And I, I I am a childhood sexual abuse survivor, so I mean it, you know. That's a topic that, you know, I, I gravitate reading to, I, I think about, you know. And um, anyway, I decided I wanted to explore it, not explore the idea of, like, female complicity in, like, a male's crime. But, but the, what I wrote was not a sexual book. It's a, it's a book about – actually, I got so really – felt really fortunate that – I got a um, my first blurb was from um, Jack Bedell, who was a poet laureate of Louisiana, and he uh, compared it to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and I, well, you know, I was like, wow, you know, because it, the carrier is a character in the book called the Doctor, who um, is not a doctor, but he calls himself that, and he um, because he gets involved ostensibly for a good reason in like doing medical experimentation. <laughs> Just to to um, because his brother died as a young boy and he wants to um, he has the money and he has the power to like I'm gonna cure this disease and so um, anyway uh, he decides to start doing experiments on young women in the village that's nearby like to use their cortisol as like a treatment for um, experimenting on this thing and he doesn't he um, feeds them stuff that makes them have bad dreams and also produce cortisol, which he extracts. But, and so there's a whole bunch of characters in the book called the subjects, which have 
bad dreams, you know, throughout this thing and are tortured and more of them are taken. And the, the kind of, I guess, parallel between like the Epstein case is that he meets a girl who his who her, she herself is, comes from a like bad situation and she's been looking to escape this village, but um, she gets wrapped up with him and she helps him take some of these girls for the experimentation and she can't, you know, she's got to like try to, you know, figure out, can I live like this, you know, doing this. And um, anyway, <laughs> that's kind of a basic um, overview <laughs> of Crow, of Crow Garage. But, um, but it goes through this whole family and there's a long, you know, um, the story of people that live at Willoughby, which is where these experiments take place. And anyway, <laughs> it's got a long backstory too. Well, sounds very interesting. That's cool that your first review gets um, compared to Frankenstein. That's some high praise. And, um, yes, that was like, also, yes, it really made my year. Absolutely, and it sounds like it has some uh, overtones and connections with what's going on these days. I mean, medical experimentation, what could possibly go wrong in that area? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, um, Epstein and Maxwell, a couple of the types of characters I was ranting about in the opening segment there. Uh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. By just... So many of them. Um, yes. So it's a collaboration, I saw. Um, you want to talk a little bit about how the illustrations oh, yes. uh, come into play? And uh, how did that process work out? Do you um, send your poems to the um illustrator first or do you get the illustration well, and the, work poems about that or is it both well we had actually i wrote everything and i would send them well, the, well here's how it works exactly the book is a hybrid like i said it where there's a poem and then there's like a chapter of prose you know and then a poem then a chapter kind of the poems are like almost like chapter titles you know they just kind of sum up because I write sonnets in it, <clears throat> not that long, you know, so it, they make a good little kind of summary. Plus, it was a um, just craft speaking. It was a really um, useful. I was not. I've written now two novels and a novella, and it wasn't my natural first thing to do. But I'm more of a poet. But I used writing the sonnets. I wrote all of them first. And so they were like an outline. Like by the end of writing the sonnets, I knew the action from the beginning to the end of the book. But then I went back and wrote it as prose, you know, um, because there was one for each chapter. And I just expanded, you know, in, in a different way on those poems. But when I first wrote them, I sent everyone, um, Amy Alexander, she's the illustrator, and she is an art teacher in Louisiana. And I'm just so, uh, she's supposed to be listening, so I hope she is. But um, she's also the publisher of this book. So um, she started her own publishing company, which is amazing, called Sweet Tooth Storybooks. And um, uh, kind of one, to publish this book and also to publish other things. She, you know, like her own children's books and things because she's such a good illustrator. So, um I was really lucky that we were friends and uh, and you know when I I first sent her one and she's like I don't even know if we like talked about it I I sent her a poem and it's like she drew something and then we didn't really say oh we're going to draw a picture for every one of these chapters but it turned out that way she there every chapter has its own you know beautiful illustration you know that she did it was a lot of work so that it you know it's kind of a situation where I mean I can't really imagine it happening any better like in a forced way like we were friends and it we had a very good rapport you know and so we just worked on it for a really long time together back and forth even though like we we don't live by each other we I don't I've never met her in real life but I adore her so it was it was a great great time very cool sounds like a awesome collaboration what's the feeling like when you're receiving those illustrations and seeing your words uh, brought to life in that form. Uh, I was really lucky. I This is the second book, too, that I've worked with the illustrator. I, my first novella that I wrote, um, it was uh, called Flutter, Southern Gothic Fever Dream, and it's the same way where it had a sonnet and then prose. And I worked with the illustrator, uh, Matthew Yates, 
he was really um, talented too. And like he was the same way I did, I would send him one. And that was, so that was my first experience with it. And it was just wild to me. It was like surreal to like get these beautiful images back and go, I invented this. You know what I'm saying? Like something about it, you know, like it just, you know, and like it just makes it bigger than words when you, you know, see somebody of, you know, gorgeous picture that someone comes up with based on, you know, I mean, I will never forget, like, I had written this poem in Flutter about um, a girl falling out of a lemon tree and dying. And um, she and he did this, that I've got the print of it hanging in my house. And, you know, it's this, the girl falling out of the lemon tree. It's just so like, you know, it touches me every time I see it, you know, because that was my first experience of, you know, somebody, you know, doing that for my words. Do you ever work in the opposite direction with ekphrastic poetry and write oh yes in response to other people's work? Oh, I love that too. Um, I just recently actually have a poem. I could I wrote um, where is it? Um, let's see. Um, let's see. It, I wrote a poem get recently by um, that was based after a, a poem by um, Mary. I mean, a picture by Mary Cassette, um, and it it uh, you know it was just so like um, touch like you know I, I it's called smallest of beasts and it's her picture of a little girl in these chairs um, and like there's a little dog next to her and uh, I mean I could read you the poem if you if you want but that was my most recent express poem that I wrote but I love to do that I love to look at art and let it you know um, you know inspire me to go places yeah absolutely it's such a cool process um, finding yeah. where the uh, creative energies overlap and bringing them more mm-hmm. fully into fruition it's very cool um, on the last time you were on the show you talked about your writing process and the way that sonnets give you those preset boundaries that you like to work within. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like with this book, you created the sonnets first to sort of set up that same type of framework that you could then write the uh, prose portions. Yeah. It gave me a map, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about my comfort zone? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, Could you Mm -hmm. talk a bit about what your process um, is like with writing the sonnets, but then also how it changes when you're working with prose? Yeah, um, sure. It's, with sonnets, it's a lot more natural to me, although, like, I will say there's some ways that I have to be more, um, like, I I don't know why. Well, I think I do know why. It's because it's, they're very rhythmic, and, I, I like, I can't listen to any kind of background noise going on, you know, um, in when I'm when I'm working on a, a sonnet, like I don't like to hear music with lyrics or um, people talking. Like I always have to have headphones on if I'm in somewhere public or whatever. But if I'm writing prose, I don't know what it is. It's like a different. I don't. I think the musicality of like poetry. I need that. Hear that in myself. You know what I'm saying. Whereas in prose, like I don't. I, you know, it just doesn't seem as. You know, it's obviously a lot more intensive because it's so much bigger you know what I mean and it's so much I I like and one thing that helps me with with um, writing prose and I think the sonnets and breaking it down into kind of chapters and pieces I have to do that because I'm not used to working on something that's so long but if I look at it as a whole bunch of small things you know put together then it it doesn't feel so overwhelming well that does make sense about not wanting the music necessarily because poetry is a process where we're looking for much more precise words or language in certain instances. Yeah. I don't want other people's words in my head. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, One of the characters you were talking about um, in Crow Carriage uh, is influenced by their dreams. Is that something that uh, you take from your own life as well? How to dream? Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, I um, I write poems. I just wrote one the other day that was 
based on a dream I had. But, I mean, I do it all the time. I mean, I have a very active <laughs> dream life, I think. And I, I wrote a tweet recently that said um, people like what they were kind of, you know, that it was like a responsibility of poets to daydream, you know. <laughs> I, but I think, you know, a lot of things, like so many times I keep, you know, like I'll write a lot on my iPhone and I always have it by my bed. And there'll be so many times I wake up and I'm like, you know, in the middle of the night because I've dreamed some line and then I have to put it in my phone so that when I wake up for real in the morning, you know, I'll be like, oh, was that any good? <laughs> what I, you know, or, or you know, like, can I do something with this, you know? But I definitely dream, have dreamed poems for sure. Very cool. And I think journaling dreams in general uh, upon first waking up sort of sets the mood for the day to be a creative outpouring kind of uh, gets the gears turning and sets the mind in the right path of being tapped into those subconscious um, energies that tap into that imagination that you're talking about that poets need. (laughs) So you have uh, this current collaboration coming out and you've done a lot of past collaborations as well. Um, Are there any other... Um, books that you've worked on that jump out um, as being collaboration. Oh, for sure. Yeah. There's, you know, I've I did a erotic collaboration with um, a friend of mine, and um, that was called Good Girl Games, <laughs> and we both wrote poems back and forth to each other, um, and that was a lot of fun. And um, and then I've done I did one that was really kind of an interesting set up that I don't know if, you know, at the time, you know, I was new to the poetry world and I was like, wow, do these things kind of happen all the time? Because it just sort of presented itself as opportunity and I don't think it happened. So it's like at the time I was like, wow, this is really neat, you know, like these things happen and I don't think it's that common that it happens. But I, we basically did a play in poetry. Uh, It's the best way I can describe it. I mean, we, three of us, um, uh, like got together and um wrote poems back and forth. I mean, I came up with the the basic outline of a plot which was it's called Victorian Doll Housing Ceremony and um the two other poets that were involved, um Tiana Hansen and um Justin Karcher, they um like my character was called the doll and it was because I'm very much into doll houses and my journal and everything else. I had written a poem called Victorian doll housing ceremony about a man who, um, like a wizard who shrinks a girl down into a doll, a, a tiny doll in a doll house that he keeps. And, um, so Justin Karcher, he was like, that would be a great, because he's a playwright. He was like, Oh, that would be a great, um, char- that's a great character, male character. You wrote the wizard, and I said, "Well, we should do it, write it like a, uh, what we called it was an opera, you know, a poetic opera, because it was, I would write a sonnet, and he would write, he writes it in a completely different style, long poems, and um, Tiana would write her. She played um, a character that became a real dark character in the book called the Firebird, and um, and so. <laughs> We would um, just every night, like I would wake up and I would, you know, I'd I'd write my poem and then Justin would respond and then she'd write her, you know, and I, and it started out with a plot that I kind of had made the parameters, but it went just kind of like any kind of role play if you were, you know, with different people where they wanted it to go in their response, you know, and we published that. Um, a few years ago, and you can still get it on Amazon, I think. But um, it was a it was a very fun and just like completely creative and wild experience. Yeah, sounds epic. A poetry opera <laughs> collaboration, yes. very cool. So, what is a, an average day like in your life? Um, what goes into it, and when do you like to do your writing most of the time? Oh gosh. Um I well I I usually write I mean I'll write something late at night but I also I'll write something in the 
I'll, you know, I kind of write throughout the day in different when I can, you know, I've kind of trained myself because, you know, life is so, especially these days, you know, it's um, after the pandemic and everything, you know, changes in so many different ways. And I used to be big into going to like coffee houses all the time and writing in little coffee shops and stuff. And I still now I'm just starting to do that again, but for a long time, I couldn't do that, you know, because of the pandemic, and that was really odd, you know, because I'm not a person that has, like, I'm not very social in real life, but, like, I liked, um, even if I didn't really talk to many people or anything, I just felt like I'm doing my little thing, but I, you know, there's that guy again, hey, you know what I mean, like, I have my little crowd of people that I just barely interact with, but it felt good, you know, and then you lose that, and you really feel isolated, you know, but I I do it now, like, some in the day, and then some late at night, you know, I, you know, I'm always, and a lot in the bathtub, (laughs) Nice place to relax and let the creative energy flow, for sure. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, seeing those random people, that's kind of the same way I feel when I go for my walks up at the park, pass them every day. It's like become like these yeah, exactly. characters in your life, even though you don't necessarily get into some deep conversation with them. It's, just like, oh, it's cool they're there. Right. Everyone's <laughs> yeah. doing their thing. <laughs> um, so you talk about not necessarily being much of an extrovert there, um, and I think you touched on mm-hmm. this a little bit last time you were on as well. Can you talk about that idea of the introvert and the extrovert and how artists have that persona that they put on to sort of get their uh, work <laughs> oh out yeah like work. i mean <laughs> yeah it is it's hard you know and i mean like people i think it's the same way when i was uh you know i was a stripper and people don't think you could be an introvert and be a stripper but um it's just like I think anybody who, you know, I mean, we we had stage names and, you know, I don't have my writing name is that my actual name. I, I don't have one of those. Um, I don't have a um, um, well, pen name, you know, but I Pseudonym, still, yeah. I feel like, excuse me? Oh, pseudonym, pen name, yeah. Yeah, I don't have, yeah, I don't have one of those. But at the same time, it's like I still you know, that my, um, I still, like, I have to work, you know, doing something like this or, like, doing an interview. I mean, it's a part of me that I, like, enjoy doing, but, like, I'm, like, I enjoy it when it's happening, but I'm nervous all the way up (laughs) until the moment that it happens, you know, and then I'm, like, and I, like, after it's over, I'm, like, oh, did I talk too much or did I, you know, like, did I mess this up or, you know, I have a lot of, you know, doubts. It's not my natural, like, state to do this but at the same time it's like um I don't know I w- when I was a little girl I was put in child beauty pageants like when I was I was a stripper I was I was just put in these situations you know where I had to like perform you know what I mean like and um uh, and it wasn't natural but at the same time like I think a part of me I definitely crave that you know I mean I don't think if you I mean I guess not every writer does you know but I mean I, I feel like a lot of writers that I I know on online you know seem to you know understand that that's part of what we do or you know but although I will say I've never done a reading in public like I've ever read my poems in person you know like I was going to I had a um um, right before the pandemic, I was um, asked by uh, a university in Mississippi to come in. I was supposed to, I mean, I had my plane ticket and everything to go and teach a workshop there. And that would have been my first time ever reading in public. And I was terrified about it. That's why I started performance anxiety, to try to um, practice reading out loud and like, um, get, you know, on a regular basis and like maybe get the courage to go practice somewhere in town. But um, then the pandemic, pandemic happened and they canceled the um work the southern writers workshop where i was going to be doing the um <laughs> doing the thing and so then i kind of felt like it was some kind of sign that i'm not supposed to be in public <laughs> well, hope, uh, that is kind of a bummer though i hope that they uh, extend the invitation and put you on the spot again and maybe force you to get back up <laughs> Um, that actually leads into another question I had about 
uh, relating to the stripping and then now being a poet, what's the differences and commonalities between the vulnerability aspect of uh, sort of being out there physically naked, but then with the poetry, it's more an emotional um, exposure. Yeah. How, how do those two play together? Uh, definitely, it's a um, the you know in stripping you are like uh, you know there there's tricks you know I mean like you like for example where I lived you were you weren't you were bound by the puritanical rules in which you live and and so where I live you couldn't um you couldn't be fully naked you had to be um you know like you always had to have a g-string and I was a schoolgirl, and I always kept my this tiny skirt on you know I had my little you know so that you have your little things that you okay well just hide this little part or you know whatever and I feel like in poetry you don't really get to hide anything you know like the things that ring most true to people are the most like naked things you know and so like I have been way more embarrassed in my, from my poems than I was stripping you know like you you know there's a lot of sub- light you know they things they do with lights and you know there's like a whole kind of um, you know thing that's helping you in a way not feel naked you know um i wore socks all the time and that always made me feel not naked like the best the best poems poems that people will sit there and talk to you about forever will um be poems that embarrass i mean like to me i've noticed that like poems i write where i'm like i can't publish this and then i publish it that will be the poem that people will um respond to the most (laughs) That is very interesting that there's nowhere to hide in the poetry. It's just a full exposure and giving um, a slice of your soul over to yeah. complete, complete strangers. At least when you're in the room with other people, you see what's going on. But with the poetry, you're sending it out into the ethereal world, and who knows who's going to read it at what time and um, what response. And what they're going to write to you about it, or I mean, like you know, there is an inter- interactive part of it that's, you know, like it's crazy, you know. And I, I think that was one good thing too that I it took me a long time to get to this point where I was publishing myself, like I was writing since I was stripping, which was in my twenties, and I'm in my forties now. So like I was writing all that back in that time, but I never published any of my own work. I had a, a person I was in a relationship who, po- who published my first poem that I they sent it out anthology and then once it was accepted they had to get my permission but it was um, I didn't submit it myself you know and so I don't think I was ready you know for that and I still there are times when I'm like I don't know <laughs> you know but like I have nights when I'm like that but it's it is a um, whole different ball game you know like when you put to put yourself out there every day, you know. And you talk about the response um, that some people will write back to you when you're dealing with the subjects that you do that get into these uh, deep issues um, that other people have probably experienced as well. Have there been any times where that feedback has sort of boosted your spirit to know that you're helping other people by being brave and putting your work out there? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, you feel like, you know, because there's so many, you know, I I also, I feel like it's a responsibility, like I'll have people write me too that will say, um, you know, hey, you're writing about this and I feel like I should write about it, but I'm not sure if I'm ready. And I always want to be like the person like. Uh, Kristen, I think your phone's cutting out. Are you still there? Oh, hey, hey, are you here? Yes, I'm sorry. It hit oh, the you're, you're back now. button by accident. Okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know no how worries. long ago I cut out. Oh, it was just a couple of seconds. No worries. Okay. Just... Well, anyway, I just I feel like it's, yes, you, it's the response. It's a great when you inspire other people to share and everything, too. I just always, I never want somebody to put themselves, like, for example, me, I would have been unsafe to share some things um, that I share now when I was younger because I was still in the, like, power of people who abused me, you know, and it would not have been safe for me, you know, and I don't ever want 
to fill anybody to fill, you know, like there's a lot of younger people in the poetry world who are like maybe still live at home with their, you know, parents who might not be a good situation, you know, or, you know, things like that. And I do like people will write me and I, I am like, cause I remember myself at that age and, you know, everybody puts pressure on you to talk about that, but you know what I mean? Like, but you also need to remember like, when it's safe for you, you know, when it's physically safe for you to talk about it, talk about it, you know. Yeah, very important to keep that in mind that everyone's on their own individual path um, dealing with yeah, you know. whatever circumstances they have currently. So that's great advice uh, that you're able to give them and help them along that path. Uh, so one of the things you just touched on a minute ago uh, was a question I had, and it deals with the socks. I wondered where that uh, came from and how many pairs of <laughs> socks do you own? Oh, my God. I don't I don't know. I know that I, I have a card catalog that is full of socks, and I have – I mean, I, I can tell you how many pieces of furniture I have that contain socks, which is three. <laughs> um, you know, like I have a chest of socks that's only socks. And then I have um, a card catalog that is taller than me that is full of socks. And and then I have uh, another just little um, set, set of drawers that's got socks in it. So <laughs> I've got three pieces, but I don't know. I honestly don't know. I buy socks all the time. As, like if I go somewhere, that's like my, um, you know, souvenir of places. And, you know, that's my go-to thing to buy. Yeah, very cool. Uh, collective items. <laughs> uh, so there's there's one thing that you touched on um, last time you were on as well that I was hoping you might get into a little bit deeper. You talked about when you were younger there in Florida, some sort of UFO situation that happened near where oh, you yeah. lived. How that inspired <laughs> that was uh, one of your books. Can you get into that a little bit? Yeah. Um, it's called the Avalon Hayes Mysteries. That's a book that um, the Daily Drunk and the whole thing is on the Daily Drunk. Like they have it in serial because they published it serially, and then you can buy it on Amazon. But it, um, <laughs> yes, I mean, like I grew up in a like now I live in a small town on Pensacola, you know, whatever. But where I actually grew up was a suburb of Pensacola called Gulf Breeze, which is a little like island that's you know on your way to the beach you know and it's just um a very weird little town you know it's like uh, you know <laughs> like one one of the things that we're known for i mean like we're in the x-files um because uh like Mulder talks about it gives his opinion about the gulf breeze ufos because um and that happened when i was growing up and it was like the talk of whatever, but it turned out to be a big hoax, you know, I mean, um, that, that, well, it's pretty much proven to be a big hoax. They found um, there was, a, you know, lots of people said they saw them, and then some people even said they were abducted by it. But they found when this man moved, who was the main person who was started this movement that got, I mean, people all over the world like a whole unit from um, was in that was in Germany, I believe. I've got um, in my book. I, I I do a fictionalized version of it, so I change some of the details, but it's the truth that a whole unit that was um, it, devoted to like doing real, really weird um, uh, research for the government that was in Germany left went AWOL and came to Pensacola because of the USOs because they thought it was the end of the world. So, like, um, and um, and they were like arrested here and everything. It's all you can look it up, but but I that's all in the book. But but it, it was just a weird thing to kind of grow up with because like my first experience is I used to write for a newspaper, which one of my characters in that book is a girl that writes for she was like my community newspaper. I had a column in it, and I um that you would hear all the time, like I would, you know, people were out covering this UFO stuff and, and like the adults, you know, trying to make sense of it and trying, and then making sense of the fact that, you know, everybody was duped. And I don't know, it just gives you like when everybody around you is like a part of like kind of a mass hysteria, it's a weird um, way to grow up. I think, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, it 
make it opens your mind to a lot of you know possibilities and um <laughs> of life and um you know i just it's always been something that like i knew i would want to write about because it just it was you know, just wild to like have people. I, I was in a little writing um, for, like group because of being a newspaper writer. I was in the writers guild of my town or whatever, and I would go with all these adults, even though I was in high school. And um, they and all of them. One of the people in that group was a man who he had written UFO books about this, and he was like beloved at a time, and then he became kind of you know, a pariah, you know, so it was like an interesting, you know, thing to see about, you know, cons, and why would a person do something like that, and so in my book, I give it a whole different reason, it's done by teenagers for love, you know, like, to get the girl kind of thing, but then it backfires terribly. (laughs) A a more innocent spin on things, well, being involved (laughs) in in that experience of mass hysteria might have just been some, uh, Pre planning for what we're going in currently in the world, it sets you up to. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, this hour has just flown by. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. <laughs> I want to turn things over. If uh, do you have some poems maybe you want to share? Yeah. I, I thought I would read one from Crow Carriage, and then I was going to read one that I published um, just today about um, Monica Kolinsky, but I'm going to read you one from Crow Carriage first. It's called um, These We Keep. And this is about the subjects, which are the girls, the dreaming girls. <laughs> this is where we close our eyes and listen to Lou lullabies collected in a desiccating book, illegible when we chant the look. Midnight, just yesterday, Crow Carriage takes two more away, Velvet Ribbon and the One Who Prayed. Or schemed when we would muffle screams. Those who forget their place inside the indelicate dreams mandated with a glass of milk. Some run from lions, bare feet beat silk. Shrieking when the nightmare ends into the palm of one of the remaining friends. This church wherein we wake requires its congregation creep. For there are devils worse than these we keep. Wow, very nice. Thanks. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I just wanted to do something that was kind of surreal from their point of view because they don't really know what's happening to them because they're um, fed this um, laudanum milk, you know, um, and they have weird dreams and everything is surreal. And, you know, it's like, you know, I wanted to write something from their point of view that was very um, drugged and dark. But this is when a poem is that? that I published. Oh, oh, that book is coming out in just a couple weeks. It's coming out, and um, like I should be getting the proof for it any day now. I'm waiting, um, and then it's supposed. To, I mean, in October, it'll be out. So. Oh, very cool. Yes. <laughs> and this poem I um, wrote. Uh, I like to write a lot of things about stripping that kind of give people. Um, a lot, like I wrote a poem about stripping on 9/11 to people, like a lot, you know, because that's exactly what I, you know, everybody's like, "What were you doing on 9/11?" I was stripping, <laughs> so like, and I, and I, but I had a unique because I live in a military town, and the fear of that day, you know, was even more like palpable when you're around a bunch of people that, like, oh my god, are you know, we go into war, you know, like, and it, you know, these young guys who like their life is about to completely change and they have no idea, you know? So I, I like to, you know, take things that also tell something about me, but also like history. And this one I wrote because I'm watching that story, American crime story impeachment about Monica Lewinsky, who I have always, you know, adored and respected. And I, like I grew up in the time when like the word slut shame, I mean, didn't exist when, when I was, like doing this job, you, it was not politically incorrect to slut shame people. It was just the way it was, you know, I live in the deep South. And so, um, you know, it was not a friendly time to women. And, and so I, when I, when she was going through all of this in my strip club, 
they um, after the impeachment and everybody was hearing about this whole situation, they did these roll call. We had these roll calls where you had to like walk around on stage and men would like, oh, pick, I want that one, you know, and you would get a table that you have to do a table dance for them. And um, we did a certain one called cigar roll calls where they were just basically to help the club sell cigars. But it was after the Monica Lewinsky um, thing and it was, you know, trying to just capture, you know, like something in the pop culture, I guess, that's going on and poke fun at the situation and I never liked it you know so this is a poem called sometimes a cigar is not just for Monica Lewinsky inside a Florida strip club 98 you can still smoke the cigars they stock so management decides to create a roll call ripped from the headlines that mocks a 22 year old girl median age of the ones who twirl before tourists Titans of this tiny town. Cigar in hand, circle around until we're picked for a tryst, topless, then helped to the ground to emulate a power disparity that makes men feel presidential while we gyrate, though the regulations of Puritans always frustrate. You can only demean, never penetrate our skin or the sheen of glittery sweat. We are all interns, lest we forget. And what is still a male carousel where we can sit here to turn? Ribbon ponies they harness, not for sale. Rented, thighs burn, mimicking rides, hundreds who never even touch. Runaways accruing crop marks, existential dreads. These slut-shaming games forever played out in woman-childish suburban heads. Compete now with a voice louder than them. The young outlive the withering dead. It is the risk of maligning younger women who forego berets, bitter days you reigned. We have the last word about all of the pain. You abandoned us to the joke you allowed us to be. For we all made mistakes like these in our 20s. My own spent dancing for crowds of married men who wanted us on our knees. Sometimes I would submit, submit to the least worthy of these. There was no presidential seal made surreal by the indignities they imposed. Cigar cellophane peeled while I took off my clothes, made it as lewd as details disclosed by Kenneth Starr, Matt Judge. Was I just passive, or did I collude in these cigar strip club role plays that condemned her and ourselves and fraught dated thoughts? Sometimes a cigar is just not. Wow. In a very intense <laughs> subject and putting a great spin on it, and uh, that seems like something you're able to do is put that unique uh, energy into your poems. I really dig that about your work. Thank you. <laughs> we're down to the final few seconds here. Any uh, final words uh, you'd like to say, and where can people go to find more of your work? Oh, yeah, um, definitely they can go to christiangarth.com, and that, um, you know, that website has my poetry journal and all my, um, you know, links to my stuff, too. And um, on Twitter, I'm at Lola and Jolie, or on Instagram, I'm at Kristen Ingrid Garth. All right, very cool. Hope everyone goes, checks it out, and congratulations on the new book. I hope you get that proof copy soon and get to hold it in your hands. <laughs> yes. Have an awesome Halloween ahead. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in here tonight. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends, and we will be back next Monday at 6 p.m. Until then, salah.